man, I'm going to mention this. Just uh, Thursday night, please be there. It's going to be great. Uh, there's a book out, and I don't know if a number of you have read it, but it's called Wild at Heart. But there are some things uh, I just love about that book, and, and one of the biggest things is that it's saying it's okay to be wild at heart because God has created us that way. And that, that we, re- we need to recognize that, that the world tries to strip that from us in all kinds of areas, but that's not what God intended. That the lion of the tribe of Judah is not a tame lion. He is, he is amazing. He is wondrous. He's glorious, untamable, and I wouldn't have it any other way. That, that who, that's my God. And uh, he has put that same heart in us. Not in, a, not in an evil and a wicked way that the world would portray, but in a good and powerful and loving and passionate way. Isn't that good? Guys, come on. Let's talk about it on Thursday. All right? <laughs> all right. Uh, well, it's great to see all of you here this morning. And uh, just, you know, I'm thankful. And I think I've said this last time Pastor Kerry went to Detroit. It seems like Detroit, all kinds of people are talking about just how, how terrible Detroit is and how awful things are happening there. I'm thankful for a man of God who would invade Detroit with the word of truth. Amen? With the power of blessing and speak blessing into a place that everybody is cursing. Thank you, God, that Pastor Kerry is going and he's speaking your word in that place. Thank you, Lord, for a man of God who will go to the places where maybe other people will not go. I'm thankful for Pastor Kerry so much in this house. Amen. Okay. Well, that's my dad moment. I'm bragging on my dad. Spiritual dad. Uh, This morning, the the Lord was actually giving me a scripture a couple weeks ago to really hone in on and start to chew and and to meditate on. and, And I was planning on preaching on it. And then even at the end of last last service, or, or the, the last uh, Sunday, Pastor Kerry, Pastor Kerry mentioned this verse as he was uh, kind of wrapping up, and he said, he's, he was quoting from Ephesians 1, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened. And I said, God, that's exactly right. And, and I'm just believing that as I'm going to speak about this this morning, and in fact, the, the ladies' meeting is jumping on this as well tomorrow. I just believe that God is saying something now in this season to us that we open our eyes where the God of this world has tried to blind the eyes of the unbelieving and even blind our eyes in certain areas where we really have unbelief, that God wants to bring light into those places, doesn't he? And that's what Paul is saying in this passage. So you can turn to Ephesians 1.15, and, and we'll just jump into this. And, and as I was, I was getting into this and thinking on this, you know, I always try and think of a, a way of, of picturing, you know, how this happens. And enlightenment, and we're going to kind of talk about this, the, uh, the, the title of the message is The Eyes of Our Heart. Uh, we were at, on vacation, and we, we often vacation down at... Uh, Valerie's sister's house, and uh, Valerie was was helping her sister making dinner, and I think that they were making like a rosemary crusted salmon. Am I making you guys hungry? Okay, um, a rosemary, but and and they were using fresh rosemary, and I don't know if you've ever seen rosemary, fresh rosemary. A, a lot of ladies say, "Oh yeah, I have it in my garden," you know. Uh, so you know, you know rosemary, and it almost looks, it's just kind of like, a, like one stalk, and there's all these little, uh, almost needles just coming off of it. And they had cut some off of, of Cynthia's fresh rosemary bush, and they came in, and, and Valerie, and I think Jacqueline was even working on it, and they were just kind of plucking these little pieces of rosemary off of this, off of this stalk. And... And it was taking a little while, and all of a sudden, and, and Cynthia, Valerie's sister, was not even in the kitchen, and she finally comes into the kitchen, and Cynthia goes, oh, don't do it that way, here. And she grabs the stalk, grabs the stalk of rosemary, and just goes, like that. And just in one fell swoop, it was done. And here they were just working and plucking and, you know, trying to get them off, and it was taking a while. And it was, it was like, oh, yeah, of course, Right? And 
And, and, and we have these moments, I think, in our lives, and there are these, uh, you know, you call them the aha moments. You know, we have the picture of, you know, the, the light bulb over your head, ding, the light comes on, and you have that aha moment. I love the aha moments. Now, some, now you might say, well, I don't like it when I, because sometimes it makes me feel stupid. But that's not the kingdom of God. God is never to make us feel foolish or stupid that there are some things we just don't know. Well, I didn't know that there was an easier way to do that with rosemary. Wow, that's a great idea. Now I know. And now I do that every time. I no longer ever pick this just one, one little needle at a time. Well, this is true in the kingdom of God, that God wants to bring these aha moments to us in his kingdom, and that we see that we had been doing this one thing just kind of tediously for so long, and it was taking so much time, and it was kind of frustrating, and a uh, a little bit annoying. And then finally God comes and he brings his enlightenment. The light bulb clicks on and then you go, yes, that's how it should be. That's how we need to do it. There are so many things in the kingdom of God like this that, that it would be great if we just had all knowledge and everything just right when we, when we become saved. But that's not how it works. That we step into the salvation of the Lord and that he begins to reveal himself in greater and greater measure as we pursue him because he wants us to pursue him with all we have. That he wants us to have hungry hearts to know a better way, to know how he wants things. And that he doesn't want to cut that off from us at all because he has given us a choice. A choice to either choose him or say, eh, I don't really want to know. That's okay, God. I'll just do it my own way. Meanwhile, he's saying, hey, I've got a great way over here if you just come. I I'm ready to give a revelation to you. And so Paul is talking to the Ephesians, and he's saying, talking to this, this new church. They're just coming into the things of God, and they're learning about the grace of God and the favor of God and, and how much God wants to pour upon them and how much identity he has for them to walk into. And he's trying to, to get them to grasp all these things and and. Ephesians 1 is just so amazing. It's, talk, it's talking about we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That, that we are even, that, that God has lavished on us his grace with all wisdom and understanding. That he gives us so many great things. And then Paul prays, for this reason, because of all these great things that God has done. <clears throat> Paul says, I too... Having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. So did they have faith? Yeah, they have faith. They have trust. They're believing in him. That I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. And then he goes on and then he begins to give the prayer that he typically prays over them. And he says, this is my prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. The, the word for, uh, for enlightened, fotizo, we get, we get the word photo. It, it, it's about exposure. It's about light. It's about light coming and, and exposing itself. And he says, I want this, this light of exposure coming into your life, this in, enlightening. But it's not just an enlightening of your physical eyes. Because where is he saying? Where is he praying that this would happen? I'm praying that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. That there would be heart, heart invasion of this light of Christ and that it would give you a whole new perspective so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of the inheritance and the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. So I want you to see that there's, there's three specific things he's saying there. That there, are, there is the hope of his calling, his calling us, what he's calling us into, what he wants us to see, and that it's incredible and amazing. This hope of your calling, I want you to get a picture of it, and I want you to step into it. This is an incredible hope for you to walk in. That you have this 
hope of your calling. I'm, I'm hoping that you see, I'm praying that God gives you enlightenment to see in this place. That you have this place to see the riches of his inheritance. The inheritance that he has given to us. All of the things, he says, he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. There is a glorious in inheritance that he gives us in his kingdom. That there is life and peace and joy and freedom and goodness and favor. And there's all of the gifts of the spirit. There is the manifestations of the spirit. The words of wisdom and knowledge and workings of healings and miracles and discernings of, discerning of spirits and prophecy and tongues. Workings of faith. That we have all of these things. He's saying, this is the hope of your calling. This is the incredible abundant life that I came to give you. And I want you to walk in. This is your inheritance. Walk in it. And then, <laughs> then he says, and what is, and I love, I love what Diane said about the power this morning. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power? The greatness of his power. I want you to really catch this by the Spirit. I want you to see it inside your heart to catch the greatness of God's power toward you. That he has this power towards you, for you. It's intentional for you, and it's for your good. It's for what he purposed for you to walk into as a son and daughter of the Most High God, creator of all the universe. That these three things, the hope of his calling, the riches of his, his inheritance, the greatness of his power. Paul says, Lord, let, let their hearts be open to see these things and to see this kingdom and to see themselves as I have created them to move into. How they cr were created to be. And when, when you do this, Lord, when you give them these pictures... Give them the hunger and the thirst for these things. That it accompanies, that when you are enlightened and you see something different, then, wow, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it that way now because that's the good way. That's, a, that's the right way. Let's, go, let's look at an, uh, just an example of this in Peter's life in uh, Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, and this is after the church has been uh, on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 were added to their number, and then they had another day, and another 5,000 are added to their number, and, and the church is just growing and, and building, and, and, and Peter, uh, Peter has this encounter with God, and in fact, he has this encounter with God, it, it pulls him out of a place that, that he had been stuck, that the, that, the, that the Jewish nation had been stuck. And Paul actually has to go, I mean, Peter actually ends up going to uh, the leaders of the church and has to explain what changed. What's changed here, Peter? Because we need understanding. So let's look. Acts chapter 11. And actually, Acts... Acts chapter 10, it kind of goes through the whole account, but now Peter is before the leaders of the church, and he's explaining to them what happened. Because there was a bunch of people that were coming into the church that they were like, no, they can't, that can't happen. So it says, now the apostles and the brethren who were uh, throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of the Lord. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him. Saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Because they were unclean. In the old paradigm. That's not what you did. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in, uh, in orderly sequence. <laughs> he just started laying it out. This is how it happened. Saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered from four corners from the sky, and it came right down out of the, uh, came down to me, and when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the, the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. 
But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. There was pigs, right? There was a bunch of pigs, you know, all kinds of different things. There's probably maybe some lobster on there. Um, but all, all kinds of things that they were forbidden to eat. But by no means, Lord, maybe some squirrels, um, <laughs> but a voice, those are from my Arkansas folks, they, you know, they never, <laughs> I just, I've been told that you guys eat those, I'm sure there's some in, in Texas that do, okay, okay. No slight, that's a, you know, it's, it was created, it's clean now, God says it's clean. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no, no longer consider unholy. Get myself in trouble. This happened three times and every time, everything was drawn back up into the sky. And it, and, it's, and it says that when this happened, it says Peter was perplexed. Said, wow, that was a strange dream. In fact, because Peter had gone into this vision right around lunchtime and he was hungry. Scripture kind of tells us that. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. The six brethren also went with me, and we entered this man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here, and he will speak words to you which which you will be saved, and you, will, you and your whole household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, how he used to say. I just love this. He's remembering Jesus talking about this. And he says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? When they heard this, okay, then what is the response? So Peter had his moment, his aha. Wow, if God did it for us, then he did it. It's okay. He, he did it just the same way as he did it for us. So it must be God. And this is the same thing that Jesus said. So he has his aha moment. And then in verse 18, when they heard this, they quieted down and what? And glorified God saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. That his revelation, this enlightenment that came to Peter, then now came to the whole church and said, this is God. This is how we're going to walk now. Now all of our, our, our Gentile, our Gentile unclean brothers can now be clean and be one with us. Be in one fellowship with us. It changed the church forever, didn't it? What a paradigm shift. What an enlightenment that we see. And I, I just hear Paul's words. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. Don't you believe that that was Jesus' heart when he was praying with his disciples? Lord, I pray that they are really getting this. I pray that the eyes of their heart might be enlightened. And even when the Spirit comes upon them, that they recognize by the Spirit the things that they were freely given to. That this is what we have in, in 1 Corinthians. It says that, that, you know, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those that love him, but we have been given the spirit that we might freely know the things given to us. So Peter has this whole change in paradigm, his whole enlightenment, and that it then spreads. And I just see this, this whole heart of God in so many areas of my own life, and I'm so thankful for ways that he has helped me to see how he sees. Because we can get stuck in these grids of our own understanding and our own paradigms, our own ways of thinking, and they keep us from really what God desires. I want to jump off of the three things that, that I just highlighted. Yeah, enlightened, enlightened in the hope of his calling, in, in his inheritance and in his power. And... I just want to go through each one of these. Enlightened to the hope of his calling. 
And I want to look at this more in depth. The, when Paul is praying this, I believe he's saying the eyes, eyes that choose to see a good God and the good plans that he has for me. Eyes that have hope in what has, God has called me to. That he's calling us to good. Even though it may be difficult for a season, God has what is best in mind for me. And even if I'm going into the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he's going with me. But let's go back to Numbers chapter 13, 25 through 32. And this is a familiar passage to, to most of you. Uh, and it's, it's the part of, uh, of Israel's history where they would say, you know, it's the, the 12 spies. And God has brought Israel to this point to the place where they could go in and inherit the land. And Moses decides to send spies into the land to see what the land is like. And I'll get there. Numbers, yeah, 13. So they're at the precipice of coming into the promised land. It says that Moses says, I, you know, in, in verse 2, it says, Send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from, every, uh, from, from each of the father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So, and then you get the whole list of who they sent. And Moses sent them to spy out the land in verse 17. And he said to them, Go up into the Negev, then go up to the hill country. See what the land is like, in verse 18. What the people are like, are they strong or weak, verse 18. Verse 19, what, what the land is like, is it good or bad? Is it, is it, is it a fruitful land? Is it, is it good for us? And, and how is it? Is it fat or lean? What are the trees like? You know, is there, is there good uh, growing land? And, and bring, us, bring us even some of the fruit. So the spies go. They have their instructions. They go. They spy out the land. They're there for 40 days. They come back. When they returned from spying out the land, at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. We know that it says that, that they were carrying just one cluster of grapes between two men. These things were huge, right? These were grapes, and they're carrying this. I mean, this, this, is, this is proof enough right here. This is pretty good land. But they didn't stop there. This is good land, flowing with milk and honey. This is its fruit. It's amazing. Verse 28, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites, Amorites. Of course, the sons of Anak were the giants of the time. And so they saw all these things, and, and they, they became fearful. They heard the testimony. And it says, it says that uh, in verse 32, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone and spying it out, a land devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There was also the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight as well because they could read their minds. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, Lord. I, I'm not adding to your word. Those were my own words. Uh, but we see, we see this, this report, right? And Moses, uh, so this, this angers the Lord as they come with this bad report, and, and they were like, no, we're not going in. Forget it, God. And then God gets angry at them and says, Fine. I'm not going to go with you anymore, you know, and uh, you can just wander the desert. And in fact, you're just going to, all of these people that, that could only see evil, they're going to die out. They're going to die out because they can't see promise. And 40 years later, 
after the last one died out, they were ready to go back in. Well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. And Moses, they come back to this place, and they're getting ready to go back in. And Moses then decides all of Deuteronomy is Moses saying, okay, this is, I, I'm going to give you all of my last instructions because I'm not going in with you. So I've got to give you all of this here. So Moses, in verse 20 of chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, says, I said to you, come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord is about to give us. He's relating what happened. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me, said, let us send men. Let's send men into this thing. And the thing pleased me, in verse 23. And they turned and went up into the hill country, in verse 25. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands, and they brought it down to us. And they brought it back and said, it is a good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Yet we're not willing to go up. But, the people, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord, and you grumbled in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. But there was two that did not have this report. And if you remember the story, it was Caleb and it was Joshua. And Caleb said, this is an exceedingly good land. This is a land that is for us, we will surely possess it with God. And that Caleb was convinced of this. And that Joshua was standing right with Caleb. And he was saying, yes, we will possess the land. And that I, as I look at this, you think, well, why? Because they saw all of the same things. And in fact, they're saying that this is the good report. This is the this is the truth about the land. It's a good land. Yeah, there's, there's, there's giants in the land. But certainly, we can overcome. We can, we can possess this land if God is for us. I think the key comes down to this, this uh, what, what God says right here. I, I mean, what Moses says, that the people were relating to him. The people grumbled in their tents, and they said, because the Lord hates us. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and destroy us. That it was, it was what they saw in their hearts that determined what they saw in the land. That they could not see it as a good thing that they would move into this land because God hates us. That that was their underlying assumption. That because God hates us, then... We're just going to be killed. And that's what God wants all along. He wants us to walk into a place of destruction. That's what God's whole intention was. To do all of these wonderful, miraculous things to bring us to this place to destroy us. That's what they, that's what they thought. And that's why they saw the way they saw. But... Caleb and Joshua didn't see that way, did they? Because they could see that God was good. That God had, had led them this whole way. And provided them this whole way. And they chose to see God and His goodness. That I think there are times that we see God's goodness, maybe even in other people's lives, Maybe, maybe even in our life from time to time, but maybe there might be an underlying thought in us, you know, God's not really going to do this, though. He's, he really doesn't, he's really not really good in this area in my life. I haven't experienced any good here. And so then we begin to interpret, we begin to look through those eyes and that paradigm. What happens in that we fall away. It's not that we're just not seeing correctly. It's because there's an underlying assumption within us that says, I'm not sure what God really is like in here. In this area, it doesn't seem like God is really good. God is good. 
and he's good all the time. And, and if we can't get to that place, and if there is a place in me, and I just need to admit it. I used to say, God, it just doesn't feel good. And, and, and I haven't experienced good. And, and maybe, there, maybe there's even a place in you that there's a wall against God because I have not experienced your goodness here, God. Could even become bitter. God, you are you're hard. You're mean. And you're not going to meet me in this place. That when we get into those places that we need to come to him and say, God, I want to meet you in this place. I want to see in a different way. I want to, I want to know that you are good here. Because sometimes in our minds, we, we know the word. Oh, well, the word says, you know, God is good at all the time. And all the time, God is good. Well, which is not actually the word, but <laughs> not that phrase. <laughs> But if we're, we're, if we're not seeing that with the eyes of our heart, is what I'm saying. If you're not catching it here, if you haven't experienced that place in him, then I need to find that place. And I think the best place to find it is in Jesus. That when I come to Jesus, he understands. <laughs> he understands the perfect will of the Father. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Did he understand that even when God, God is calling us to some things, maybe there might be some difficulty along the way, but it's for this glorious end, this wonderful place that he wants to bring us to. We need to see God's goodness in his heart. When God is asking us to step out in ways that we're just not understanding, I remember when we uh, were graduating I was graduating uh, from seminary, and I had someone in our denomination come to us and say, you know, I'd really like you to consider planting a church. And really, in my mind, I was like, yeah, right, you know, uh, I'm looking at other churches and, you know, doing the pastor thing, <laughs> trying to find that, that, that great pastor gig in the sky. No, but just trying to find just the, the right place for me. <laughs> You know, okay, what's the signing bonus? You know, hey, what kind of car am I going to drive? You know, it wasn't that bad. I wasn't quite that bad. But I just really, I, I was kind of dismissing it. And I told my mentor, and he said, you need to listen to that. You need to really pray on that one. It's like, okay, well, okay, I'll pray about it. And uh, so I just kind of started to pray about it. And then I was talking with Valerie about it. Of course, you know my wife. She's just like, Brah! you know, jump on everything. And so, so I, I tell her, and she's like, wow, that sounds amazing. It's like, that's not what I wanted to hear. It's like, it's in Iowa. I don't even know where Iowa is. I guess somewhere, somewhere in the, uh, the heart of the country. Anyway, so we're, we're talking about that. Is it really 12 o'clock? <laughs> okay, it's 12 o'clock. Um, that's not what, that was not in the story. God, this is not fair. You know, I am going to be, one of these days, I am going to say, let the sun stop. And it will stop that I can preach and I can finish my message. And all my notes... <laughs> Because that's the important thing. No, that's not the important thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so where was I in that story? It was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I was bragging on my wife because she's like, go ahead, go ahead. And so, uh, so I started praying on this, and I really started feeling the Lord was like, mm-hmm. Yep. And I was like, nope. It's like, yep. So just in my devotions, you know, I'm just going through just different scriptures and reading through the word. And this is key, really, with all of these things. Man, we got to keep in here, keep, keep reading. The Spirit is just going to bring alive these things to us. And he just brings me to Moses. <laughs> of course, brings me to Moses. Moses had to struggle too. Struggled with his calling. 
God was saying, I want you to deliver my people. He's like, Paul, oh, you got the wrong guy. I tried that. It did not work. I was feeling the same way. And just, just what leapt off the page at me when Moses was saying, no God, no God, no God. God says, I will teach you what to say. And surely I will go with you. Then I was like, oh great, I have no excuse now. But I got on that, I got the heart of the Father, and I was enlightened, and I saw this thing in a whole new perspective. This church planting thing was not Jim going out and planting a church. It was the Lord using Jim and going with him to do what he wanted to do in Des Moines, Iowa. And I said, I could do that. I can listen to you and let you teach me everything that I need to do. And that's what he told me. I will teach you what you need to do. I was like, I can do that. And I'm so thankful that we did. God just, God worked in our lives. It was difficult. Let me say that. It was difficult. It was hard. But it was so wonderful and it was so good and it was perfect for our lives. I'm so thankful for everything that God did. I'm thankful for the people that God saved. I'm thankful for the people that we connected with. I'm thankful to see them grow in Christ. I'm thankful that they moved into places that they hadn't been before. I'm so thankful that the kingdom of God happened because I stepped out and believed God was good. And I had the hope of his calling that it was good. That he, hasn't, he doesn't plan for us to just be in, go into destruction. He's planning for our good, not for our calamity. That Ephesians 4 says, therefore, <laughs> this is so good, and Paul is saying this, therefore, I, as a prisoner of the Lord, I am, I am now in prison. Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of, of your calling. Isn't that so good? Here is a man in prison, and he's saying, I, I charge you, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. I'm sitting here in prison, but I know that I'm walking in the calling of the Lord in my life, and I know he has good plans for Rome. I know he's going to change Rome because I've come here. I don't know, I get charged up when I see things like that. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you've been called. With all humility, gentleness, patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. You know that David, whew, wow, I can't even, you know that when David was anointed king, Jesse came, uh, Samuel came to, to anoint the sons. It says that he couldn't, find, he couldn't find a king among them. Surely this was the king. No, that wasn't the king. Surely, well, no. Do you have any more sons? <laughs> so finally they said, well, yeah, we got one out in the pasture. Bring him to me. And so David comes running up, and there he is. And Samuel says, here. And he anoints David king. And there's great fanfare, and they, they lift David up, and they charge him into the city, and he becomes... That's not what happened, was it? If you know the story of David, he went back out into the pasture. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, now I'm with the sheep again. All right. But I believe that God started stirring, was enlightening David in that place and that he was seeing from another perspective and that God had stirred this hope of his calling and that when he saw the lion and the bear that I'm a king I'm wiping you out and that when he came before Goliath I'm a king was he a king yet? No, he was not. If I'm a king, I need to walk in a manner worthy of God's calling because he saw it in me. He sees it in each one of us. He sees this 
incredible calling that he wants us to walk in. And I'm just going to have to stop with calling. But we, he has this calling for us to walk in, to step in, to see ourselves in this calling. Great is your calling, the hope of your calling, and that you have everything that you need. He didn't call you because he, he thought, well, he, he's so much better than everybody else. He's like, no, I'm just calling him because I love him, and I'm going to be with him in everything that he does. I want to do something. Um, just a demonstration. And I want some... Uh, Strong guys. I'm going to have, could Tim, uh, Tim, Steve, could you stand here? And Harold and Steve and Joe, could you stand up here? I want you guys to just kind of stand like right up here and, and look menacing, intimidating. <laughs> Sorry, camera guys. <laughs> camera guys are like, why do you do this to us? No, I want you to face out that way, okay? But be, be kind of close, yeah. Thank you, Harold. Yes, please. That's, that's very good. Be formidable and scary, awesome looking. <laughs> okay, and this is good. <clears throat> but Caleb said, Caleb said when they, brought, when they brought Israel in, right, and they started dividing up the land, when, when all of their enemies were defeated, and they started dividing up the land and all of the portions. <clears throat> and Caleb was watching this. And he was seeing all these portions going out and, and the things that were given. Kind of waiting. Okay, okay. Then he finally, he stood up and said, went right to Joshua and said, God spoke to me about the land that I saw, that I said was good. Give me my mountain. Give me my mountain. And surely, even if the giants are in the land, God is with me. And we will surely possess it. That there is, there is sometimes things in the way, isn't there? For us to walk into everything that, we, that God has purposed for us to walk in. That there is great promise over here. There is incredible promise on this side. And God, is, God sees it. He's like, yep, I, and I'm, I'm going to get you there. And I need you to see that you can get there. I'm going to have Judah come up. And Judah, I want to, wait, don't get on stage though. I want you to stand Stand kind of close to Miss Pierre. There you go. There's Judah. Um, <laughs> there's a picture God gave me. And there, there's some, there's a picture actually on Facebook, and it, it's really kind of cute. And it's this picture of all these pit bulls, and they're all in a row. And there's this tiny little cat, and it's just walking right in front of the pit bulls. And I've seen this picture before, but God was just reminding me of this picture, and he, was, he kind of tweaked it in my own mind. That what that little cat was feeling like was this huge lion inside. And that it really didn't matter what, how menacing these guys looked like, because I knew who I was, I, would, I wouldn't fear. There's a scripture I um, just want to share with you. And David, David talks about this. Of course, we, you know, we, we've just talked about David. It says in Psalm 18:28, it says, For you light my lamp. The Lord illumines my darkness. For by you I can run a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. <clears throat> Notice how, what happened first? He says, he illumines, he lights my lamp, he illumines my darkness, for I can run upon a troop, and my, by my God, I leap over a wall, because I see now as he sees. 
that these obstacles that the enemy wants to throw in my way, now that I see like he, like he wants me to see, it's no problem for me. So I want you to picture Judah, but now I want you to picture the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I want these guys to, now, now they see Judah, but as soon as Judah takes a step, what I want you to do is I want you to see the most menacing lion that you've ever seen and what you would do. And Judah, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you run towards this troop and I want you to leap over the wall. I'm going to give a picture of this. And, and you guys remember, this is a ferocious, <laughs> a ferocious, hungry lion. But let me just jump off of that a second too. This is a ferocious, hungry lion. He's hungry for the promises of God to be made manifest in his life. And he will not allow anything to deter him from that place. So Judah, when I say one, two, three, and you can roar if you want. That's fine. I don't, I don't care. I want you to just run, run upon this troop, and I want you to leap over the wall. And I want you to get over here, okay? You ready to do this? All right. Remember, he's a ferocious lion. <laughs> All right. You're catching, you're catching me. You're catching me. Okay. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Woo! What happens then? This is my son. In him I am well pleased. He's walking in the hope of his calling. He has an enlightenment to see who he truly is in Christ. He knows what God has purposed for him, and he will not let any obstacle deter him from what God desires. Amen? Amen. You can go sit down. Hallelujah, God, we thank you this morning that you are a good God. We thank you for enlightening the hearts of our understanding. I thank you, Father God, for helping us to see as you desire us to see, Lord, that we will walk in the calling and purposes and plans that you have for us. Father God, that we will see ourselves as the sons of the Most High God, filled with, these, with the lion of the tribe of Judah, with his with his fierceness with his hunger and thirst to see the kingdom of God come to pass. Lord Jesus, I thank you that this is what you've given to us. I pray that we would see as you desire us to see, O oh God. Just as Paul said, for this reason, I bow my knee. I don't cease to stop praying for you. Lord God, we pray for the church in this day to arise and to see who you have called us to be, O oh God. That we would run, we would walk and not grow weary. We would run and not faint. Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you equip us for every good work. Lord, that we are partakers of the divine nature. And Jesus, we thank you today. Greater are you within us than he who's in the world. Greater are you within us than any obstacle in our path. Greater are you, O oh God. And we submit ourselves to those words. We say that your word is true and the devil is a liar. You are big on the inside of us, bigger than any obstacle that we could imagine, that you are big, you are great, you are good, and you shall be that all the days of our lives, O oh God. So we come into this place, Lord Jesus, and we stand and we say, thank you. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for enlightening our hearts today. Continue to let us walk in a manner worthy of that enlightenment. That we walk as you want us to walk. <laughs> oh God, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with me. Would you just please stand with me this morning? If, if the Lord is just speaking to you, I'm going to ask the
the ministry team to come forward. If you have obstacles that, that you have, that you have come, kept kind of bumping up, keep bumping up against, Lord's, the Lord's desire for you is to break through. I just declare even breakthrough today. And so I'm just asking if you need prayer, if, 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 if you need prayer for anything, but especially Lord, if, if, you need, if you need prayer for breakthrough, I'm just going to ask you to come. Where, where you haven't seen breakthrough before, it's been kind of discouraging, taking the wind out of your sails. I just ask you to come, and we want to pray and believe with you for breakthrough, that you see as God wants you to see, and that you can break through to what God has purposed you to do. So God, I just thank you so much for each person here. We thank you for your kingdom, that your kingdom comes. Your kingdom is at hand. Your kingdom is here. And I thank you for this, Lord God, and we give you praise in this place that you have never left us, you do not forsake us, Father, but you hold us by the hand. Lord, we just thank you. Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We say so, O oh God. Let it be so today, O oh God. Let it be so in our lives. Let it be so in this church. Let it be so in Tyler, Texas. Let it be so in the United States of America. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so today. God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. You are dismissed.